Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Philip Martin, Senior Investigative Reporter, GBH News Center for Investigative Reporting. Callie Crosley has the night off. Tonight, remembering Mel King. King was a champion of the people. He addressed many critical issues that impacted the lives of a rainbow of communities here in the city and beyond. His presence historically and politically was unmatched during the height of racial tensions in the 1960s and 70s. King's leadership against racism led to what we have today, a multiracial government. He was a giant of a man who spoke softly, yet his words were powerful. His passing at the age of 94 is a loss for communities of color and all residents of Boston. Joining us now to discuss Mel King, Marita Rivero, Principal, Rivero Partners. She is also the former president of the Museum of African American History and former VP and GM for radio and television here at GBH. James Dilday, Principal Attorney, Dilday Law. Rasan Hall, Principal, Rasan Hall Consulting and former director of racial justice program, ACLU of Massachusetts. And Darren Howell, political director, 1199 SEIU, United Healthcare Workers East in Massachusetts. Welcome to all of you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. One of the many causes that Mel King took up, of course, and we got our, we're gonna talk about this later, uh, was, was housing. But right now, I want you to talk about what you think is Mel King's legacy. Um, and I'd like you to do that in one minute or less. And I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with you, Marita. Well, I think, I think his legacy is really uh, walking around the streets of Boston and many other cities. It's the many, many people he touched who followed his style, who understood what he was talking about, who had a chance to think about community development, what needed to happen. Uh, so I think his legacy is something that's living. I think he meant to, he meant to pass that on as he went along. Many of us, as we get older, keep looking behind us, saying, "Where are they?" I think he started early to begin to develop people who would be behind him and who would move forward. That's a big legacy to me. That's a major legacy. And James, you've known him since you were 12 years old. Yeah, I've known Mel since I was about 12 years old, when he was a social worker, mm -hmm. and he guided me to keep me away from the streets. You all don't know it, but when I was that age, I wanted to be either a pimp or a bookie. Because that's the people I saw who I thought had money and were leading the good life. Mel, you know, said, no, you're not going that route. Mm -hmm. And he gave me an indication of what it was like to do other things. But when you talk about his legacy, I look at it from the fact that when we were young kids, you know, from my generation, he kept us straight. He made us do things and see things that were positive within our local community. But I think probably the best thing to remember about Mel is that he always had a good word for everybody, mm -hmm. you know, and he would look for us. And he, the thing that he did, he was a uniter. He brought all the people together. You know, even long before he ran for mayor and set up that rainbow coalition, he was a person who walked the streets and did positive things for most people. That's something he was, uh, that, that was central to his, his core, this notion of, of, of coalition building. And Darren, you're of a new generation uh, who, and you got to know Mel along with other political leaders uh, in the city. What is his legacy for you? Um, his legacy for me is an example of how to approach the work of service um, and how he gave back. Um, some of the things that have resonated with me in these last couple of days is his compassion, his humility, his humbleness, his integrity, um, just the approach to helping others. Um, I, for me, it's something that I'm going to remember about how he never, he was a gentle giant, um, felt intimidated in his space, but he always was so welcoming. Um, so. His example of how to approach the field of service and the work of service is something that I'm, I'm going to cherish. And which also reminds me of something, uh, when we'll talk about his mayoral campaign later, but Rasan, uh, you uh, 
didn't know Mel that well, but he obviously had a major impact on you. Yeah, and you know, first of all, I'm humbled to even be a part of this panel because there's so many other people who could be here talking uh, about his legacy. But I think one of the things that stands out most about Mel King and his legacy is that he wore bow ties. Uh, no, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, in, in all seriousness, I mean, the, the willingness to step out uh, for political campaigns, whether he was successful or not, communicated to community that there is a place for us within the political sphere. Uh, and, and Mel understood that very well, and he worked towards that, not only just running for office, but building the political infrastructure of people who could fill these positions, right? We don't see a Kim Janey as the first black mayor of Boston if there wasn't um, a male king or any number of current city councilors. And, and so that vision of what could be for us and his actions of stepping forward and making a sacrifice of his time and the time of his family uh, to run for political office, to cast forth a new vision of what could be possible, uh, not only for black people and people of color, but for all people in the city of Boston or wherever uh, we uh, stand to represent our communities. And without question, folks, one of the most uh, lasting and obvious uh, aspects of his legacy, you can see right now in the, uh, in the South End. I mean, one of the many causes that Mel took up was this issue of housing. Uh, and the specifically the fight that led to the tent city development. I mean, he started this in 1968. This was an affordable housing complex in the South End. Listen as he explains the planning process. If things go as the tent city corporation uh, has planned and is working on, then they'll get an urban development action grant. They'll get the uh, kind of loan that they need so that the mortgage, I mean, so that the construction can go forward. And we will have close to 300 units of housing, uh, three-fourths of which will provide for families whose incomes are low and moderate. And obviously, one reason uh, Tent City stands out is because we are right now in the midst of fighting for affordable housing. We're still doing it. But what, what Mel King was able to accomplish in the South End is remarkable. Given what the South End represents now, there are very few, relatively few people of color left in the South End, mm -hmm. except for those pockets that he was able to carve out through Tent City. They started fighting uh, to keep uh, the BRA from the Boston Redevelopment Authority from taking over this land that was supposed to be a garage in 1968. And by the 1980s, you had an affordable housing uh, development. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to turn to James to ask him to address this question of King's fight for housing. Why was that so central to his, uh, his core? Why was this uh, particular development over 20 years uh, something he fought for so, so vigorously? Well, I think you have to look at the, the, the fact that during that time frame, the South End was really a poor neighborhood. You had poor blacks, you had poor whites, you had a lot of um, Lebanese and Syrians. None of us had money. And Mel had lived on Yarmouth Street just about all of his life, and he said he wanted to maintain a process living in this community where it wasn't going to be completely gentrified and have a, he wanted to make sure we had a place for people who were marginalized in the income strata of our society to have a place to live. And what people don't really talk about as well is they was also active in the fight against I-95 from coming through and just, you know, coming through the black community or the low-income the, um, low community in South End in Boston and just dividing the community mm -hmm. to make way for a highway. Mm -hmm. So you look at the highway, the garage, Mel was in the forefront, no garage, no highway, housing. And he succeeded. Yes. And the key, that's the key. He succeeded. Marita, you came to Boston, Tufts University. You were a, a student. You were uh, an activist around this time. Mm -hmm. um, and one of, during the time you were in Boston, of course, we also had this fight over school desegregation. Right. Uh, to fight, to, 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 to oppose a school desegregation in the form of busing. Mel King stood out uh, at that time as well, had, had just became a state legislature, uh, legislator in 73. What, were you, what was your impression at that time? Of well, I, was, I was noticing all this. I mean, we were in some freedom schools. You know, we, we, were, we were busy uh, participating in the city. 
we weren't just sitting on a campus in Medford. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say as a new person coming to town, one of the things I, I, I noticed was the real leadership coming from the West Indian community uh, in Boston. You know, there was sort of an Elma Lewis mm -hmm. uh, over here with the arts and Lewis Wolcott or Farrakhan. His mother was still here, you know, over here, you know, Mel. It was just a very cohesive, strong community that was kind of holding down Roxbury, if I could say, buying homes, uh, active in the community. Uh, and I noticed that. I mean, it's, I noticed it years later when I moved from Boston. I mean, I could talk about that later, but uh, these were examples of what could happen in other cities. So when I did move, I moved to Washington at one point. They were looking back at what Mel was doing. In Washington? They, yeah, this wasn't just uh -huh. a, he wasn't just a Boston kind of phenomena. Uh, people in other cities were paying attention to this man who was taking on housing, affordable housing issues, the urban redevelopment issues. All of this was happening in other cities. And here in Boston, we had this person who was just dedicated to being in everyone's face about it. Uh, he, was a, he was a real model. And so I, I really looked at that. I took away from that the possibility of leadership uh, at a community level that could have influence very broadly, nationally. You know, the thing about uh, when a, a person passes up someone of Mel King's stature, mm -hmm. there's always the present deification. But at the time he was um, oh, yeah. uh, doing, uh, he was an activist, he was often vilified uh, by media and others. And uh, Darren, that's something you've uh, thought about, uh, that vilification. And, uh, uh, and, but I'm wondering, like, uh, despite all those negative uh, comments about uh, Mel King, how did you cut through that nonsense and basically arrive at a point where you felt that this man deserved more than what he was receiving? Um, so how I came in contact with Mel was at the request of men who were serving life sentences trying to have a community meeting with folks in the community and Mel was willing to go meet with those men and uh, get, got to give credit to who was the uh, initiator from behind the walls at the time uh, innocent man Darrell Jones um, and to see the reactions of those men because um, it was a predominantly lifer population and how they greeted and interacted with Mel and Mel felt at home with those individuals and and they were talking about how they supported his campaign and they remember him doing certain things and me to just watch and observe that um, it was my first uh, organizing activity so to just reach out to community elders to say hey men behind the wall would love to your attention um, they're trying to figure out how they can participate in anti-violence initiatives and they want to offer their support but they need to be connected with the people on the outside and your name was someone that they asked me to reach out to and to see his willingness his eagerness um, and he loves saying you know just pass me the ball, you know, um, and, and, and just, just seeing his energy, um, that was the way to see the person um, beyond the rhetoric that may have, may, may have been. Um, so he was never a caricature uh, as, as a result. Right. Uh, and, you know, and it's funny you said that um, he was comfortable with, he seemed to be comfortable with everyone. Mm -hmm. And that was key to also the formation of his Rainbow Coalition, which uh, uh, he succeeded in bringing people together across spectrums here in Boston at a time when there was extraordinary div division. This was most pronounced, of course, uh, in 1983, when he was building uh, his campaign to become the mayor of Boston, becoming the first uh, uh, black person to reach the general election. And after losing the mayoral race in 1983, Mel King sat down with Say Brother host and producer Beth Deer about staying optimistic on the future of the Rainbow Coalition in Boston. Take a look. They have uh, worked hard, and it's not just around this campaign because they come out of a legacy that says that uh, we're going to change things, that they're about self-definition, they're about self-determination, and they're about self-liberation. And when you have people like that who are involved in working with you and who are uh, positive people and who uh, really hang in there, then there's a great future for them. And it means a great future for the city and uh, for the country as well. You know, I find it uh, fantastic to go from uh, this, uh, this picture of Mel King here 
and to go to you, Rasan, with the bow tie. And, and Rasan, you just ran a campaign uh, for district attorney. Uh, and uh, like Mel, you did not win your campaign. Um, but you formed, uh, as you were running, a rainbow coalition of your own. Right. Mel King, uh, do you feel he had a role in that, even if he did not have a role in that directly? Yeah, because he showed what was possible to, to run a race like he ran and build the coalition that he built at a very, as you said, racially divisive time in the city of Boston spoke volumes to the possibility of people coming together, connected on their lived experience and the ideology of lifting people up out of poverty and creating opportunities for everyone. And I, I could not run the race that I ran in Plymouth County trying to bring the Haitian and Cape Verdean communities in Brockton as well as the black community and the white communities without th throughout the rest uh, of Plymouth County without looking to an example like Mel King, a, 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 a coming together of a rainbow uh, of people and not focusing on the differences but focusing on what brings us together, what is the common experience that we have that needs to be addressed that gives us a platform to inspire hope and move this conversation forward. So absolutely. You know, the, when you're talking about bringing people together, something you said and something Marita said, um, the, the something about, so he brought people together uh, across races, often across classes, mm -hmm. and he also had uh, something, there was something traditional about that, a West Indian tradition, uh, Mel being the uh, one of 11 kids, mm -hmm. uh, family from the Caribbean, and a lot of folks would come together, all of us I think have at some point sat down mm -hmm. at Mel's house with him and Joyce, uh, and, and some of their kids, Michael among them, for his famous brunches. <laughs> Let's yeah. talk about those famous brunches because it wasn't just a question of food, mm -hmm. and, it, it was a question, and it wasn't just a question of discussion, it was also strategy. Marita, you went to a number I of those did. brunches. Talk about I did. That. I, I, again, I thought as a kind of relatively new person in Boston, you, knew, you can be new in Boston for 40 years, but I mean, when I was really kind of new in Boston, to be kind of welcomed, to have some place that was welcoming me, um, come over, you know, and, and be there with all kinds of people, you know. People from the Chinese community might be there, the Lebanese community, as you mentioned, different parts of the black community, different leadership levels. Um, for some sometimes fun conversations about the latest movie and other times mostly just uh, serious conversations about where we were going and what we wanted to do. Uh, and I think to, to find a space where that could happen uh, in a city that people say, oh no, you, you know, we're, we're all in our different enclaves was, was uh, very important. And it was the backdrop of this uh, kind of rainbow coalition idea. I was in Washington when Jesse Jackson came through to announce his run for the presidency at the convention center. And I just heard Mel coming out of his mouth. I just, newspapers have mentioned rainbow coalition, rainbow, but I, I heard Mel in Jesse's mouth as he talked about what really had to happen at, at the community level. And I knew somebody who was acting on that. Uh, you know, that's very important what you said. I think a lot of folks don't realize that uh, Jesse Jackson was heavily influenced by Mel King. I think so. Uh, and because what Mel King uh, represented was a successful yeah. Rainbow Coalition. Jesse Jackson achieved that, that, that same level of success to some degree. But it was amazing, James, uh, at the, I remember Mel King talking about this uh, in 83, and the reason I remember it, uh, like a lot of you, I played a role in his campaign. <laughs> In 1983, and I remember the uh, at at one of the breakfasts, him talking about what was happening on a national level, but but what had to happen on a local level. What happened? What had to happen on a local level, for for us to go from uh, uh, the extraordinary racial divisions in the city uh, that had not eased uh, dramatically in 1983 to uh, elect, uh, allowing a black man, getting a, a black man in the general election uh, in Boston that year? Well, I think the key thing there was somebody wh whom people could believe in. Mm. And mm. Mel was an individual who had this eclectic personality. People would just be, you know, they, they would just 
gravitate towards Mel. And Mel was able to get people to work with him, to listen to him, and to support him in what he did. And you, when you talk to Mel and you listen to him, it didn't matter whether you were black, white, Latino, Asian, it didn't matter to him at all. He looked at everybody as an individual. Mm -hmm. He accepted you as who you are, and he wanted you to do better. And that allowed people to gravitate to him and support what he was trying to do. And more particularly, in that time, you know, we had you had Louise De Hicks, you had Dapper O'Neill, you had Jim Kelly, all of whom were staunch racists. And Mel stood out, because he was this big black man who was a welcoming force to everybody. Not only welcoming, he seemed fearless. And Darren, one of the uh, interviews I heard uh, my colleague Adam Riley conducted with, um, with Mel King about uh, 10 years ago, I was struck by him saying that he, was, he had no problem going to the Charlestown housing projects in 1983. Um, and I can't begin to explain to you how difficult that was in 1983 for a black man to walk through the Charlestown housing projects. But where, there he found some allyship, a term we use now. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, comment on what you, your impression of his fearlessness. He seemed to be willing to go anywhere. Yeah, I think his convictions was very transparent, um, that he stood on his values and his principles, um, and he didn't have no problem being in a space where those values and principles needed to be shared. Um, something that I've been able to observe is you can find light in the darkness, and I think that's where he was willing to go to find it. Like, there was allies across the city that were uh, had uh, things of common interest, and he was able to tap into that and say, and that's what I believe, because every time you have mentioned 1983, I'm like, I was one. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, so not being privileged to that experience, but then in my own way, with an Occupy movement that just took place around the ec economy and the 99% and just trying to see different people coming together, looking at how are we all uh, experiencing this issue in a negative way and what can we collectively do to address it. I, I've been fortunate to have that experience that I tried to say this is my generation's civil rights moment um, when, when that was occurring. Um, the fight for 15 with the fast food workers going out into the street. So yeah. when I reconnected with Mel, it was always this is what was um, I was involved in that he would remind me to keep doing and it was good trouble um, I yeah. guess um, yeah. so that's what I've enjoyed just knowing that there was others that came before that led that that model um, how it could be approached well let's be let's sort of wrap this up the way we began it uh, in terms of Mel King's impact his legacy with their murals all over the city with the face of Mel King he uh, has left uh, behind the South End Technology Center that he founded uh, and cared for and nurtured. And of course, his wife Joyce and their six children. What else has Mel left behind that actually we could talk about in terms of its forward uh, trajectory? Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the, the main things uh, is his legacy of organizing. A lot of people talk about being organizers, but they don't know what it means. And if anyone hasn't already uh, read Chain of Change, uh, that his describes book. his book, um, that describes in immaculate detail how organizing actually happens and how one victory builds to the next uh, victory. And in his willingness to reach back um, to the next generation of potential organizers, you look at people who are on the front lines doing activism and organizing uh, work right now. You look at folks at like City Life Vita Urbana and other organizations right to the city of Boston. Those groups have been influenced by his legacy. And so to the extent lawmakers want to celebrate and give tribute uh, to Mel King, they should also do it in enacting legislation on the things that he was fighting for. Indeed. Marita, very quickly. I think it's a fabulous model of leadership. This this is how you do it. You know, it's you listen, you work in coalition with other people, uh, you're open. At a, I called him when I was at the Museum of African American History. I had a, something. I called him up, you know. He just said, uh, don't worry about it, you know. <laughs> do what you're going to do. I mean, be open to people. Indeed. James, quickly. You know, I think he was the person who was humble. He led, but he wasn't caught up into himself. Mm -hmm. He was always giving of other to other people. And that's what I loved about Mel. 
He would look out for you, but he didn't want to get the accolades. Right. He was the leader who said, don't say I'm the leader. Just say that I'm here working to do something positive for all of us. I noticed that. <laughs> the, indeed. And Darren, the last word, uh, and you're that last generation, if you will. Um, to build off of what Rashawn said, I believe he's a, he was a visionary. I, I think that there's levels to organizing, and when you reach the level of being a visionary, then you can see beyond what anyone that's collectively coming together, and you know that all those individuals are going to make that vision a reality. Um, so he was a visionary to me uh, beyond his time. Indeed. Mel King. Mel King. Great man. Well, folks, thank you, <laughs> Rasan, Rita, James, Darren. That's the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. Thank you for joining us. Now stay with us as we continue our conversation on our digital platforms, YouTube and Facebook. I'm Philip Martin, Senior Investigative Reporter, GBH News Center for Investigative Reporting. We are on YouTube and Facebook with our post show, continuing our discussion on remembering Mel King. And one of the aspects of Mel King's life that a lot of people may not know about, and uh, it became much clearer to me when I was with Oxfam America, uh, which at the time was based in the Bay Village. Uh, when Mel King would come down to Oxfam's office, and he was focused on what was happening in the city, yes, but he was also focused on anti-apartheid. Uh, apartheid would still ravage South Africa. He was concerned about what was happening in Haiti uh, to, uh, to uh, people there who were suffering under the de Valliers, uh, so on and so forth. And I was wondering if you would talk, Marita, about what you think, um, Mel, why do you think he connected so much on an international level, including with Nelson Mandela when he vis came to Boston uh, after his release um, in the early 90s? I, uh, you know, he was interested in media or communication, uh, in voice. He was really interested in giving community people voice uh, through all these projects. Uh, and I think when you expand that idea, it's an international idea. Uh, it's, it's you want to make sure that whatever we're understanding as the story is actually the full story mm -hmm. uh, and that you're understanding it top to bottom. You're not listening to one race or one nationality. You're really looking for the kind of information that makes the experience meaningful. So his, it's a lesson in how something small, concentrating on community voice, local, local community voice as an idea for really sharing knowledge is an international value and an international idea. And I think that's why he connected with other leaders <laughs> who were also working, working on something that wasn't just top down, but, but in fact uh, included a, a that, larger vision. That's a great take. That, that's a great take. Darren, uh, what's, what's your uh, view as, as an organizer uh, and reflecting on the, uh, the fact that he organized, again, beyond just the immediate communities uh, but had a focus also internationally. I think that uh, 
with organizing, there's always opportunity, right? And and I think that being able to elevate the issues that he was focused on locally by connecting get to the larger issues that were being discussed in society is just the organizing tactic of trying to get the job done. Um, how do you shed light on examples of not only the direct impact that you're experienced, but others are experienced as a way to try to seek a resolution? So I think that was uh, partially maybe part of his motive of just being in tune to what was happening uh, around an issue that he was uh, cared deeply about. Spoken like an organizer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so James, uh, the, the, you, the you were present during a yeah. lot of, uh, you were certainly when, when Nelson Mandela arrived and certainly when, when um, Aristide, uh, the former president uh, who was deposed, uh, came, to, uh, came to Boston. You know, I, I'd like to say one thing. We were talking about Mandela. Back in the 70s, there was a gold coin that South Africa was producing called the Kruger Air. That's right. And it used to be advertised on Channel 4. Now, Tapa Karu and I set up a group called the Steve Biko Memorial Committee. Mm -hmm. And Mel was active in advising us. And we picketed Channel 4, and we got the Kruger Air ads taken off Channel 4. But Mel was so instrumental. People didn't know it, but he was behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Tapa and I were out front. But Mel was the man. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And I, the, the Krugeron had a major impact. It funded South African apartheid. Yes, it did. Yes, That's it right. did. Yeah. They said, give an ounce of love. We said, give an ounce of blood. Right. <laughs> With the Krugeron. Indeed. And Rasan, you had it when you headed up uh, justice uh, programs for the ACLU here in Massachusetts, uh, did the name Mel King uh, come up uh, when you came on the scene, if you will, and, and not only in the context of local justice, but uh, the campaign for immigrants' rights, for example. Sure. I, I think that's one of the beautiful things about Mel King's work is that he tied the local struggle to the international liberatory people's struggle. Recognizing the maladies that afflict us here at home are some of the th same things in action globally. When you talk about migration, the movement of people across borders, it's because of some form of oppression. And some of those very same forms of oppression that we're seeing in other places, white supremacy, predatory capitalism, militarism, are the things that lead people to move. And so those are some of the things that he was seeing here in, in Boston, and I think tying into and connecting with what people were experiencing and fighting against internationally had resonance in the very same things that he was fighting against and working on here. And so to talk about uh, school desegregation, to talk about union jobs, to talk about community development and housing, those were the institutions that were failing poor and oppressed people, and we needed to mobilize and organize to make sure that those th institutions were built out from the ground level, from a grassroots level. And so that was the beauty of the connections that he made to the local struggle, to the international struggle. And you know, he had a very uh, systemic way of doing that too. And he, one, one uh, process was through something called the Community Fellows Program that he put together, founded mm -hmm. at MIT, right. working with people like Professor Melissa Nobles and others uh, in, in terms of taking folks uh, who uh, were natural leaders and basically instilling them with even greater uh, skills uh, in terms of uh, organizing and so on and so forth, including on an international level, including Brazilians, for example, mm -hmm. some of who are in leadership today. Um, do you, th and, and that's something that's going to continue, by the way. I'm just wondering if you could talk about that, uh, <laughs> Marita, if you, yeah. uh, the impact of that kind of program and his program specifically. He, he was a born teacher. Mm -hmm. He was an organizer. He was a teacher. That's right. Uh, he taught at Boston Tech. Uh, that's right. That's yeah, right. yeah. He was just uh, an innate teacher. He was just going to help you move from point A to point B. He's going to listen to it and help you move. And I think the organization of that community fellows program uh, really just kind of formalized what he was doing all the time anyway, but it gave people a really kind of direct way of understanding who they were. It empowered people in ways that they might not have been empowered before. He was all about empowerment. I think that's that whole thing about community voice and attention to you. I'm hearing what you say. You're important. Say it louder. <laughs> say it to, in front of more people. Let me empower a community to act in its own best interest. And uh, 
I think that that teacher, Mel, Professor King, right, mm -hmm. Dr. King, uh, was the one who really looked for form for ways to do that, whether it was the Technology Center mm -hmm. or, or the Community Fellows Program, which I always wanted to be a community fellow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, or these other, other structures he set up. So it wasn't, uh, he was setting up, I think structures is the right word, he was setting up structures that could connect uh, the work to work internationally, if that's what it was, nationally, locally, but he was he was really passing on a deliberate uh, way of proceeding for that change of change, that chain, ch that, yeah. chain of change, that chain uh, of change. That's right. Uh, it's kind 1983 of book. Yeah, that's curricula right. that, yeah, he, that he, right. he created. So yeah. that's what I would say about about programs like that. Yeah, and uh, Darren, you you uh, have benefited from that uh, directly as an organizer in terms of. Um, this chain of change. By the way, that book has been updated mm -hmm. uh, at the insistence of young activists. Uh, but talk about the uh, the impact organizationally. Um, you spoke earlier about the fear, like not having, not being afraid to uh, approach the issue mm -hmm. with the right mindset. Um, so one thing about this work, you talked about humility, um, James. Um, how do you do it when you know you're trying to impact the masses? Um, and, and you have to have a system, you have to have a structure, you have to have a vision. And I, I listened to some of his speeches earlier today where he said, how do you plan when you don't have a plan? Mm. Uh. You know, how, so the listening piece is definitely uh, important because the plan in your head might not be the plan of the people. Right. Um, so being able to really guide what has been shared, um, I've learned how to listen. But I learned how to approach things fast too to get the to, to see the needle moving forward. That is so important. Um, listening is something he did attentively uh, and deliberately, and I would say methodically. Um, and, and and James, I'm thinking about again you as a 12 year old, uh, uh, and at the time Mel King was a social worker yeah. uh, in uh, the South End. You had to listen. He made <laughs> you listen, didn't he? Absolutely. You know. Yeah. That's how I first met Mel King when he was a social worker at the South End Settlement Houses. It was actually the Harriet Tubman House in the, initially on Holyoke Street, mm -hmm. and then it went to the South End Settlement House on um, Rutland Street. But Mel would be there, and he, could, he, he had a sense of who we were and what we were doing without even asking us. He had that sixth sense, and he knew that I was thinking about that street life. And he let me know in a nice, quiet tone, it's not the life for you. You know, you need to be here in this place, coming in here after school, doing your work, you know, playing basketball, organizing the people around here, but you're not gonna be out there on those streets. You know, I didn't, he didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that he saw me trying to hang out, but I'm sure he did, <laughs> because he knew what I was doing. <laughs> if you had one song, we're going to wrap this up, but if you had one song in mind that would eulogize Mel King, I have one. Uh, I'm going to take it because uh, you might be thinking the same thing. I'm going to grab it now. <laughs> but uh, but what's going on is eternal for me. When I think about Mel King, I hear Marvin Gaye singing, What's Going On? Because the song was relevant then, it's relevant now, and it seems to have just extraordinary resonance. What music? Either one of you can take this. Uh, all, 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 we're going to ask all of you, but okay. what, what, what song, what goes through your head when you think about Mel King, this mm. tall, powerful, soft-spoken man? I, I'll go for the, uh, one of my favorites. I, I'll give him Bomb and Gilead. Ooh. There's a Bomb and Gilead. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. It heals the sensic soul. And I think part of Mel's personality, he, he controlled that big man thing. Right, it wasn't big, imposing, impressive. It was, it was someone who came at you in a way that invited uh, participation and love. And I think he was a he, he at heart, he wanted to heal, heal our community and heal us. So I'm gonna give him bomb. Excellent. Yeah, I, I would say uh, Kendrick Lamar's We Gonna Be All Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that's that one. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Right? <laughs> I'll take uh, Sam Cook. Change's gonna come. Change's yeah. gonna come, uh, okay. I was thinking of a change is gonna come, but um, let me switch over and talk about Otis Redding uh, and uh, sitting on the dock of the oh, bay. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. You know, uh, you know, you can actually see Mel now sitting on the dock of the bay, mm -hmm. sitting at the Boston Harbor, you know, smiling. looking out, smiling, looking out oh, on his yeah. city. Folks, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rita, Rasan, <laughs> Darren, James. Much appreciated. Thank Mel you. Mel King. That was good. Thank you.